Well, again, sorry. Well, again, good morning. Welcome to Truth Away. My name is Daryl, and I get the privilege of being here this morning and celebrating this fantastic day. Is it not fantastic? So, as Robert led us, you gotta understand, for thousands of years, there has been the tradition where on Easter Day someone would say, He is risen, and the reply would be, as you guys did, we stand here proclaiming as loud as we can that our Savior Jesus Christ is risen. And we celebrate that today. So, again, welcome, and we are glad you're here. Uh, and, but i got to tell you, I have the joy, not only do I have the joy of being here today with you guys, I also have the joy from time to time, actually pretty much every day of the week, to fill in, at, or to be a... I'm going to start over. I have the joy of working at a school. How's that sound? I have the joy of working at a school. And it's a good school, Heartland Christian School. And I, I'm, I'm an aide. I get to work with a student who needs some assistance from time to time. And that's my primary role. But every once in a while, every once in a while, the, the administration will come and say, hey, listen, a teacher's had to step out. Uh, we need some help. Can you substitute for us? And so I will, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm game. And so I've had the opportunity to come in and substitute from time to time. Well, and it's been a great experience, and, and I got to thinking about this idea of a substitute, particularly a substitute teacher. So when I say the word substitute, what do you guys think of? When you think of, maybe it's a substitute teacher, and no doubt you are recognizing, you're thinking back to all those times in your academic career where you had a substitute teacher and you treated them, him or her, with great respect and <laughs> kindness. And you remember, you know those substitute teachers? I just love, I was so happy that, that it was a break from the usual and maybe it was a little bit easier. And you're like, I'm just going to treat them perfectly. How'd that go? Yeah, right? That's, I mean, that's what I think of. <laughs> or maybe you're thinking of in, in terms of athletics. Where, you know, hey, the, you know, the starter, you know, gets tired or injured and we got to send in the substitute, right? Maybe you're on the basketball squad and you were the number six or number seven guy. And you were pretty good, but not quite the A team, right? So when you think of substitute, we think of maybe the B team or the not quite so good. Or, you know, you get an idea. Not who should be there. When we come here, when we're, we're here celebrating today, what we're celebrating is that we are celebrating the greatest substitution ever made by the greatest substitute, period. We are here celebrating the greatest substitution ever made by the greatest substitute ever. We are here celebrating... Easter, that Christ is risen. We need to back up a few days, a couple days, maybe to Friday. And if you're here on Friday, we, we talked about this. Because a few days ago, historically, not actual, literal few days ago, but you get the idea. On Good Friday, Christ died, did he not? And he died on the cross. And i got to stop right there, because we need to remember exactly who died on the cross. Who is Jesus? So Jesus, we've learned, especially as we've been walking over an overview of the Gospels the past you know, number of weeks ago, Jesus is the perfect man. Perfect. Meaning, Jesus did nothing wrong ever. Amen. So Jesus, who did absolutely nothing wrong, he did things right all the time. He thought the right things. He spoke the right things. He did the right things. He reacted in the right way. Everything. In accordance to God's perfect standard in law, Jesus fulfilled it perfectly. We get that? So when we say Jesus is fully man, absolutely fully man, he, he, he bled, I mean, he, he walked like us and talked like us and all that stuff. And moreover, as the perfect man, he lived perfectly. Whoa. Furthermore, Scripture is very clear in declaring and telling us that not only was Jesus fully man and perfect in that, he is God. 
God himself, God incarnate, God who's come to live with us as one of us. So when we see, say Jesus died on the cross, we got to remember who we're talking about. Jesus died. Fully God, fully man. By, by the way, you've got to think about this. God Almighty. So we think of Jesus as God. He's God incarnate. He's God here with us. He is God who, remember in Christmas time, I mentioned this, that when we need to contrast the manger with where God was, where Jesus left. So Jesus, you read in Revelation, it speaks of Jesus being enthroned in glory and sitting in the right hand of the throne of God and in and, and, and all authority and all glory. and all. It's just fantastic. And that's where Jesus started because he's God. And he condescends, he descends, he comes all the way down to become one of us. And we are certainly not all of that, are we? And he became one of us to walk as one of us, to be one of us. And, 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 he, and, he, came, and he came and he was born in a manger. Whoa! From the glory of heaven down to a manger. <laughs> Some manure, smell the manure around and straw. Like, wow! But it goes even farther, doesn't it? Because not only is there the condensation, the, the, the condensation of Christ, but then, the, then now there's humiliation of Christ. Because what does he end up doing? Dying on the cross as a criminal. He wasn't a criminal, but he was as if he was one. He died a criminal's death. The, I mean, can you imagine? So this is Christ who has died. Furthermore, he died... On our behalf. If you have a Bible, turn to Romans chapter 5. I touched on this a few weeks ago, and I want to return to it. But Romans chapter 5, verse 6 and 7 and so forth. And we're going to spend a couple minutes here. Because Paul writes, he's speaking of, of Christ. He's speaking of Christ's work and death on the cross. He says, you see, verse 6 of chapter 5 of Romans, you see at just the right time. Now hold on. At just the right time. You know what that tells me? This wasn't an accident, was it? That from the very first pages of Scripture, God has had this plan that he is bringing to fruition. He's bringing to completion this plan so that you and I can be saved because we've sinned and we've broken the relationship with him. He, from the very beginning of page, time, in essence, he has had a plan so at just the right moment, right when God had planned it, right when it needed to happen, what happens? You see, at just the right time, when we were, we, let's include ourselves in that statement, we, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Did you catch that? When we were still, <coughs> what? Powerless. I, I mean, I, I don't have time to dive into this, but all I can say is the older I get, the more I realize how little power I actually have. You guys feel that way? There's a whole lot coming down the pike that I'm thinking, you know what, I, I really can't do much about that. While we were still powerless, powerless against sin, how are we doing on, on living the perfect life? How's that going for us? See, I'm powerless, you're powerless. Paul rightly says, while we were still powerless, Christ died, what's the next word? For. Christ died for us, for the ungodly. Did you catch that? We who are powerless and we are ungodly. That's a pretty accurate description of us, isn't it? If we're honest, compared to a holy God, yeah, that's accurate. But wh while we were so powerless, Christ died for the ungodly, meaning us. Now, 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 listen, he says, very rarely will anyone die for a, for a righteous, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. Now, this makes sense. We, we, we think of this. We, we, we watch the movies, and, 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 and the, the main character sacrifices themselves so, so that, you know, the, 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 the girl or the woman could go on, you know, I think of, like, the Titanic. I, I, this isn't my notes. It shouldn't be. But, 
you know, think of that Titanic and what is this, Jack's in the water and he, and he just drifts off so she could live. And, and we're like, oh, that's so noble and caring, you know, that's fantastic. And he's like, oh, and she, you know, you deserve to live. And, right? And we, we get that. Like, that's a noble, we commend that. Rarely will that happen. But when you don't, you know what you hear even less of happening? Someone who in full recognition and full clarity, they're not deluded, they're not delusional, they're not brainwashed, but someone who understands things clearly dying for a wicked, wicked person. Right? Hey, you know what I understand is? You do not deserve to live. You are, you know, X, Y, and Z, really, really bad person. You've done horrible things. You know what? I'm going to die for you. No, what do we call for? I ain't dying for you. You get to die because that's what you deserve. This is the contrast Paul is painting. You pick up what he's laying down here? He says, now very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, although it sometimes happens, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God, but God demonstrates his own love for you and I in this. While we were Fantastic individuals, noble, character, honorable, deserving to live? No. While we were sinners, meaning ungodly, meaning wicked, meaning <clears throat> while we were sinners, Christ died for us. See, my point, <laughs> this is substitutionary language, isn't it? Christ died for me, meaning as a representative of humanity, he died in my place. He died in your place. He took the place. That was, so when he died on the cross, suffering the very wrath of God, what was he doing? He was suffering the very wrath that we as ungodly, wicked, powerless people, powerless to this power of sin, as those people, we, he's doing that for us. He is our substitute. The beauty of it is when God sent his, a substitute, he didn't send the B team, did he? He didn't send the second best, not quite enough. No, no, no. Who does God send? He sends himself. He sends his only begotten son. The only one capable of saving us. The only one even remotely possible and able to endure the full wrath of God and to be a substance. I mean, think of it. He didn't bring, he didn't send, oh, I'll try it again. I'll maybe try you, send you in. No, 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 no. He sent Jesus to die on a cross for you and for me. The, the best substitution. Christ died for sinners, the ungodly. But we're here today, not only that he did he die, what are we here celebrating? He rose again. He rose again. I talk about this often, time, often but Christ rose from the grave. We just read, uh, Roger read in John chapter 20, that Christ is risen. Not only that, did he rise? We know he's risen. That, that it is a historical fact of a historical event that is validated and, and witnessed and attested to by count, I mean, hundreds of people. Independent witnesses and accounts verifying that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That now he didn't rise from the dead as a ghost. Ghosts don't eat as Jesus did. You can't hug a ghost as Mary did. Right? She wrapped her arms around him, and the next word is, he says, let go of me. Right? She, she held him as if before, then, before he was crucified. Does that make sense? He was bodily risen alive. Christ is risen. He died in our stead. He died on our behalf. And three days later, just as he promised, he rose from the dead, and that's what we're celebrating. What this means is, that as our substitute, Christ's work was sufficient. Not only was it sufficient, it was accepted. And not only was it accepted, it was complete. Book of Hebrews, you can read, read that. It, it tells us, it speaks of this. See, Christ rose from the dead. If he didn't rise from the dead, we could think, well, that sacrifice didn't work. 
Right? Does that make sense? The, the Old Testament was replete. So you sacrifice an animal in, in your place. But what would you have to do again later on? Uh, do it again and again and again. But Christ, having died and rose from the dead, nothing more needs to be done. And, and, and it, furthermore, we know that it was accepted by God as a, our sacrifice in our stead. Why? Because he rose from the dead. If God did not accept it, stay dead. Does that make sense? But nonetheless, he rose from the dead. Rose to the book, end of the book of Luke and the beginning of the book of Acts points to not only did he rise from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of the throne of God. We know his sacrifice is accepted because God let him in. He's right there. Does that make sense? Accepted and sufficient. Just, <laughs> let's be frank. No one else's sacrifice, no other sacrifice could ever come close to the work Christ did on the cross on our behalf. So, we know that because of Christ's resurrection, we can have eternal life. For God so of the world that whosoever believes in him, trusts in him, but by faith, they, we receive eternal life. Because of Christ's work on our behalf. And so I have eternal life. You can have eternal life. Which begs the primary question of today. Do you know him as your Savior? Have you made that choice? called out to God and say, God, I am ungodly. I am unworthy. I am a sinner. And I need to be saved because I deserve the wrath of God for, the, for rejection of Him. And yet, God, I'm reading in Your Word that You died in my place so that I don't have to, and I want that, and I'm trusting in Christ for that. That's simple. I hope every time you come to an Easter service, frankly, I hope every time you come to church, I hope every time you talk to me, I hope you every time, when you, I hope you hear that and understand that over and over and over again. And I, my earnest prayer is that everyone here has made that decision. Because it is literally the difference between an eternity with God or one without. Let me continue. Now, because Christ in resurrection, I can receive it by faith eternal life, forever life starting now and lasting forever, forever past the grave. With God, we're in a real place called heaven. Now let me push this a little bit further. Let's spend a few minutes. I want to take this one step further. You guys know Psalm 23? I've heard it, I've heard it once or twice. Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, before we get to Psalm 23, John chapter 10, Jesus makes a couple interesting statements. John chapter 10, you can turn to it later. John says something. He says, you know what? He says, Jesus claims to be. He says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for the sheep, my sheep. Oh, we know that's a perfect, I mean, it's like aiming straight at the cross. Jesus, who is the good shepherd, lays down his life for the sheep. Now, let's put this in, in proper context. All right. Lays down life for his sheep who are just cute little lambs, innocent and pure. No, we're dumb as rocks, and we wander off, and, and we get in the thickets, and we think we can tangle with bears and win, and, and yet we need someone to come to our rescue in Christ. We need someone who goes up against the bears and says, I'm willing to die. I lay down my life for my sheep. And furthermore, a couple verses later, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and the sheep know me. I'll paraphrase. Okay? So Jesus is, is saying, I am the good shepherd. Psalm 23. Oh, we got to read this one, folks. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. shepherd. Oh, guys. The Lord is my shepherd. The one who laid down his life for you and me. See, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. 
He guides me along the paths of right, right paths for his name's sake. In other translations, he guides me along the paths of righteousness. Now here's what I want us to key in on today. The Lord is my shepherd. Jesus is our shepherd. Why? Because he rose from the dead. If Jesus stayed in the grave, could he be our shepherd, leading us to, to, to still waters and, and restoring and refreshing our soul and, and making us lay down in green pastures, leading us to things that even if you're not a shepherd, you understand, I want that. <laughs> right? And, and so the reason he is our shepherd is because he rose from the dead. Because if Christ stayed dead, this first few verses wouldn't be true. Oh, oh, one more. It goes on. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. So, Christ, does he know how to lead us to righteousness? Absolutely. How do we know that? Because he lived rightly, perfectly all the time. Oh. It continues on, verse 4. And you guys know this. He says, even though I walk through the shadow of death, the darkest valleys, whatever your translation, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I walk what? Through? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Christ is our good shepherd. If he stayed dead, could he lead us through anything? Oh, but we have this promise that, that our good shepherd is going to lead us through the darkest valleys, the darkest of the shadow of death. Why? Because Christ has already been there. When Jesus died on the cross, did he not go to the darkest valley? And because he rose from the dead, he can lead us through death itself. Because Christ rose from the dead, you and I have a Savior, have a shepherd, who can lead us, walk us through. Maybe he doesn't walk us around it. He doesn't walk us over it. He doesn't eliminate it. He walks us oftentimes through the very darkest days. And we know he can because he did already, and he is risen. And, lived, and he lived through it. You see what I'm saying? It goes on. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. I know we don't do that very often, but we recognize that's a really good thing. You show me honor and refreshment. My, my cup overflows. I'm just, you know, this is good stuff. And surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You guys ever felt like you're in the presence of enemies? And there's like bad things in here. And yet God, the, the psalmist saying, David saying, listen, God, you, Lord, you prepare a place of honor even in the midst of oppression, even in the midst of my enemies, even in, and how in the world can he do that? Let me tell you how. Because he rose from the dead. When Christ rose from the dead, who was he victorious over? Who did he defeat? Death itself, the evil one, the author of death. Right? Any opposition, any 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 oh, let's have, any enemy, Christ has already proved he's already been victorious over them. So whatever we're facing, whoever, whatever, he's victorious over it so much that he can actually prepare a table for me amongst my enemies. Does that make sense? Why? Because he rose from the dead. He didn't stay dead. And surely your goodness and love will follow me. All the days of my life. See, that's a present tense. That's like right now, isn't it? Your goodness and love will follow me. How do we know God is, is goodness and, his, and he loves me? How do we know it? We just read it. But God demonstrated his love in what? He died for us. 
And if he died for us, I'm pretty sure we know he loves us. And I'm pretty sure he's, this will be true. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And he's, because he rose from the dead, he can still express that love. That's now. And then it gets better. What's the last verse? Psalm 23. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Did that, that, what, what? How long? Forever. How is that possible? Because Christ is risen today. He is alive today, seated at the right hand of the throne of God forever. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, we could not dwell in his house forever, could we? But because he rose from the dead, Psalm 23 takes on a whole new, like, whoa, how is Psalm 23 that we all find comfort in? Rightfully so. How is that possible? Because Christ is risen today. So God grants us eternal life. Let me, let me kind of conclude with this thing. There's two types of people in the world. There's two types of people. Those who accept by faith God's substitute on their behalf. And this isn't perfect, and don't don't push it all the way to its extreme, but hey, you, I hope it's helpful. Okay. Let's go back to our substitute teacher model, okay? <laughs> See, what Christ has done is it was test day. And let's be honest, we were failing the test. God was giving us a test, and he said, this is my standard. How are we doing how are we doing living up to that step? We're, we're failing the test. And yet God sent his son to sit down and take the test for us. How did he do? Perfect. Again, this isn't a perfect illustration, but it says if he sat down and he wrote in the answers and then he hands it to the teacher... And the teacher looks at that and says, yep, that's exactly right. And you know what I'm going to do? Ha, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this as if you took the test. A plus. Daryl B., you don't deserve it, but hey. Well, yep, do, no, yep, A plus, 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 plus. See, one type of person says, you know what? I don't deserve it. I don't know why the teacher, or I don't know why God would do that, but I'm in. I want that. And God graciously... And I mean that in every sense of the word, he graciously grants us this, the passing grade. That the perfection of his son is put on us and applied to us. Second type of person sees a substitute teacher come in and said, oh, that's the B team. Look, he died. Second type of person says, I'm good. I got this. I'm good enough. My only question is, how did last week go? Did you live up to your own standard of right and wrong? Did you do things, everything right perfectly, even by your own standard, let alone by God's perfect, incredible, awesome, Standard? Yeah. We know. And yet, we're here today celebrating that Christ rose from the dead, proving that his substitution on our behalf was adequate, sufficient, complete, nothing more needed, and that he offers that forgiveness, that salvation freely to anyone. And it goes beyond that, that even then we are we are part of God's family, and he is our good shepherd, leading us to the things we want. And I don't know about you as a Christ follower. I forget that sometimes. But now when I sit here on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, celebrating Christ's res resurrection, oh, that's good news. Let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, again, we simply come and we, we celebrate. I don't know how else to phrase it. We, we praise you. We are so joyous 
that you rose from the dead. Not only because it brings salvation to anyone who believes in you, that places their faith in you, that simply calls out on you for the salvation of their soul, the forgiveness of their sins. Not only that, Lord, but we realize that because you rose from the dead, all of your promises, all of your word, everything is true because you are risen. In your name we pray. Amen.